Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so today I want to tell you about two recent works uh, on using ideas about information dynamics, so how information moves in some quantum circuit or under some quantum Hamiltonian evolution, to understand various aspects of noisy quantum devices. And so in the first part of the talk, I'll uh, tell you a story about how we can use you know, this notion of how information moves to understand how noise impacts the fidelity of uh, quantum computations or quantum simulations. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, I'll turn to a slightly different question, how noise impacts the computational complexity of some quantum computation or quantum simulation. And these are based on two works uh, with my PhD advisor, Norman Yao, one out uh, some time ago, now in PRL, and one that's hopefully out soon. So I'll start with a pretty generic introduction that I, I'm sure you've heard in some form or the other before. So we are all interested for some reason or another in coherent large-scale quantum devices. And uh, we know that these you know, have the potential to achieve large advantages in various different fields, running from computer science to physics to quantum chemistry, et cetera. Uh, but we're not there yet. And one of the primary obstacles to realizing large, coherent large-scale quantum systems is noise. So right now, we're, we're trying to do some computation or some Hamiltonian simulation. And as we're doing these gates or evolving under this Hamiltonian, things are going wrong. So maybe our laser or microwave pulse is a bit stronger than intended. Maybe we have some spontaneous emission or coupling to an environment. And we know that eventually, with quantum error correction, we can, in some smart way, detect when things go wrong and react to them and fix them so that they don't ruin our computation. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, this requires lots of additional capabilities and overhead that are, are not available in the devices we have right now. And so the, the spirit of you know, quantum experiments we're doing right now and in the, the coming years is uh, focused on what we can do with noisy quantum devices. So we're doing some computation, some simulation, things are going wrong, and we basically just do nothing about it. We just let them go wrong, and we hope that that doesn't have too great an impact on the result we get in the end. And uh, this has spawned you know, many different uh, subfields that, that people are thinking about over the last decades, or decade maybe. Um, and, and the focus here is on what we can do with these noisy quantum devices. One, one thing which we can do, which is very natural to do, is various physics experiments. There have been lots of exciting uh, recent experiments uh, in this direction. There's also been a lot of work on uh, NISC algorithms, so how we can you know, do some noisy quantum computation that achieves some advantage in, you know, for example, some optimization or quantum chemistry task, as we already heard about. In a slightly different direction, there's also been lots of work on benchmarking noisy quantum devices. So say I have some device and I don't really know how noisy it is. I'd like to understand you know, what are my error mechanisms, what's their typical strength. We heard about this in both of the earlier talks this morning. There's also various works on error mitigation. So, you know, are there ways to mitigate the effect of noise so it has a smaller effect on my computation, even if I can't change the fundamental error rates in my device? And there's also been lots of discussion on the, how noise impacts the complexity of the computations or simulations that we are doing. And so today, uh, I want to address two of these these fields. Uh, so I'll first tell a story about benchmarking noise, understanding how noise impacts the fidelity of quantum devices, and second, how noise impacts the computational complexity of devices. And so uh, I'll, I'll start, uh, I'll kind of motivate the, these two questions uh, side by side, and you can, I'll, I'll raise some open questions and you can hold them in your mind. And then I'll introduce a very simple and intuitive framework and show that it, um, allows us to make some progress uh, along both of these directions. So I'll, I'll start uh, by diving a bit deeper into this question of benchmarking noisy devices. Um, so we've already heard some about this this morning. But um, say we have you know, some noisy quantum device. How do we learn what our error mechanism is and how strong it is? 
One simple way to do this, if we have a gate-based device, is just to benchmark the individual gates individually, some randomized benchmarking, flow K calibration, et cetera, and hope that when we do all of these gates next to each other in some large quantum computation, that they perform about the same. However, this is undesirable for, for different reasons. We might be interested in whether additional things go wrong when we try and do lots of gates side by side, or we might have some analog quantum device where it's not so simple to sort of isolate individual pieces of our, of our system. And so for this reason, uh, there's been a lot of effort to develop um, and understand sort of large scale benchmarking methods, sort of benchmarking methods that work for you know, an entire interacting quantum circuit. One way to do this, which we heard a lot about this morning, uh, is through sampling based approaches. So we, we do whatever circuit we're interested in, we measure you know, the full output at the end, and we compare that output that we get from our circuit to some classical computation where we know what we should have gotten for the perfect device. And from this, we can extract things like the many body fidelity of our computation. And this is really quite nice, but it does have some drawbacks, namely this, this classical simulation step. And uh, as, as Daniel remarked upon, we're increasingly entering the age where we cannot classically simulate the devices we have. And you have to play various tricks uh, to, to get these methods to scale up to larger and less noisy devices. And at some point, there likely will be some fundamental limit to, to these methods. And so uh, there's also a different approach which applies kind of much more generally and avoids this need for, for classical simulation. And it's really simple, and it, it's been thought about for quite a long time. And this is the Loschmidt echo. So say we have some circuit or simulation we want to do. I've drawn it as just some unitary here. This could be e to the minus IHD. It could be a bunch of gates. Well, one thing we can do if we want to benchmark how well we implement U is just to apply U, then apply its inverse, and measure the fidelity to get back our initial state. So if our circuit is perfect, everything is unitary, this will have fidelity one. If we have some noise during our circuit, these red arrows, uh, this fidelity will be less than one. And we hope that you know, the amount this fidelity is less than one, one tells us something about the, the errors in our computation. So this is a very old idea. It dates back to sort of fundamental questions in thermodynamics in the, the 1870s. Um, and for a long time, it was just kind of a thought experiment about you know, the fragility of many body time evolution to noise. Uh, until starting in the 1980s, nuclear magnetic resonance experiments uh, started actually implementing these Loschmidt echoes in many body quantum systems. So in NMR, you have a bunch of nuclear spins. These are basically spin one halves. They interact with some dipolar interaction. And uh, you know, very pioneering experiments figured out how to invert that dipolar interaction. So how to apply U dagger, E to the I plus IHT, um, and, and measure things like this Loschmidt echo. And um, you know, this sparked some theoretical interest. There was a lot of progress in single particle quantum chaos, uh, using single particle quantum chaos to understand these Loschmidt echoes in the 2000s. And there's been various NISC experiments uh, more recently implementing these. Uh, but there's kind of a problem uh, still outstanding if we want to use these Loschmidt echoes, say, to benchmark a quantum device. And that problem is we actually don't know how to relate the uh, microscopic error rate and the time of this computation to the fidelity we get up in the end. So there, there's tons of experiments on Loschmidt echoes out there, again, dating back you know, quite old in NMR. And we can plot these fidelities as a function of you know, time or noise strength. Uh, these are various NMR experiments going to larger and larger system sizes. These are more recent NISC experiments on trapped ions and superconducting quantum processors. And on all of these, we get some fidelity for this over time. And typically, we fit some functional form to this fidelity. Maybe it's a Gaussian, maybe it's an exponential, maybe it's a sigmoid. But we have no understanding of why this functional form changes for different circuits or different Hamiltonians, so for different unitaries here. And uh, we don't understand you know, how it decays in time or how it relates to the, the microscopic error mechanism in our device. And um, again, people kind of thought about this and figured it out for single particle quantum systems uh, in the early 2000s, but it's been an open question for many body systems for some time. And so, um, 
Yeah, this, this is exactly the, the question I just said. These experiments tell us that how this Lashman echo decays depends on the device, depends on the circuit we're doing, uh, but we don't understand how. Okay, so, so that's kind of a first open question to, to hold in your mind. The second is um, you know, not how noise impacts the fidelity, but how noise impacts the complexity of some noisy quantum computation. So imagine we do some quantum circuit, like shown here. We start in some initial state row. We do some gates. Imagine for simplicity that between all the gates, we have just some single qubit decohering noise, where you know, with some small probability on each qubit, we um, lose information to some environment. And then we measure you know, some observable at the end. Um, if you ask a physicist how noise impacts the computational complexity, they'll tell you, you know, a very intuitive answer, which is that noise kind of somehow limits the entanglement, the mutual information that can grow in this system. And so intuitively, we expect noisy quantum systems to be easier to classically simulate than noiseless systems. This is just some, some basic intuition. And in some cases, you can make this intuition a bit more rigorous in 1D, for instance. But in general, this is, this is just intuition, and it's been very hard to make rigorous uh, for a long time. Um, so on a more rigorous side, there's, there was some really nice progress on this question in the 1990s, um, in the, this paper I'm citing here. Um, and they showed two things. They showed both an kind of upper and lower bound on the power of noisy quantum computation. The upper bound is super intuitive. It basically says, if I have some noise in my device, so some decohering noise, this kind of pushes me towards the maximally mixed state. And uh, they, they put a precise bound on you know, what depth or what time we can run some circuit before my system is just entirely at the maximally mixed state. And so clearly, uh, this time turns out to be log n over the noise rate. If we have small noise rates, we can compute to long times. If we have large noise rates, shorter times. Is that log of the qubits or log of the space? Qubits. Mm -hmm. um, and so this places some fundamental limit on what we can do with noisy devices. We can only apply gates up to some depth log n over gamma. After that, it's just useless. It's the maximally mixed state. But it doesn't tell us anything about the computational power of those devices at earlier depths. And so for that, uh, the same work provides a, a lower bound where they provide an interesting construction and show that, to some extent, log depth noisy circuits, so you know, circuits that you know, have some depth up to, up to this decohering time, are about as good as log depth noiseless circuits. Uh, and so this naively kind of seems to, to close this problem. You know, we're saying noi noisy circuits can compute to log depth, and up to that point, they can do basically anything noiseless circuits can do. But the construction they provide is actually very unnatural, unfortunately. The idea is uh, if I have some circuit of depth d, at for every depth layer in my circuit, I triple the size of my system. And then I apply the same circuit on every copy of my system, and I do some like quantum majority votes between like different triplets at each time step to try and push my errors into some copies and have fewer errors in, in other copies. And with this kind of huge in practice, but in principle polynomial overhead, uh, you can show that uh, any noiseless circuit can be simulated with low error on a noisy device. Do they get some factor between the upper and lower bound, or is it Well, there's a polynomial overhead in the number of qubits. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's exponential in the depth, but the depth is log n, so it turns into a polynomial okay. in well, overhead. Well, yes, yes. Um, Okay, so, so this is a really nice proof of principle result, but it's also incredibly unnatural for the circuits, like the NISC circuits that we're thinking about doing right now. And so uh, because of this, you know, more recently, people have started thinking about how does noise impact the complexity of circuits that we're actually performing. Uh, so we're not performing these hugely redundant circuits, we're just performing some circuit that we want to know the answer of. Great. Can yeah. you think of this procedure as an installation? Yeah, at least at a high level. Yeah, yeah. It, mm -hmm. it, it's trying to push the, the error, the entropy, into you know, other copies of the system and keep one copy low error. Yeah? I maybe missed this, but are you making any assumption about the noise model 
Yeah, so this works uh, at a technical level, it works for unital noise. Um, the simplest form is just single qubit decoherence. Uh, these results change in a way that people understand if you have like spontaneous emission. Um, the story becomes a bit different in that case. Yeah. So for everything I'll talk about today, just single qubit decoherence or something similar to that. Okay, so, so people have been, yeah? So I guess I, I also, what do you mean by complexity here? Or what is it? Yeah, so I'm thinking like the uh, complex, so say I tell you the circuit and the initial state and whatever you measure, what is the classical complexity to compute, to take those input parameters and compute the actual results of the circuit? Um, okay, and, and so on this question, how does noise impact the circuits we're actually performing? There's a very nice result um, out just this year um, by Aharonov et al. And it's kind of followed a, a long line of works by Shun Gao and many others, showing that random noisy quantum circuits are efficiently classically simulable. So uh, these are circuits where every gate in the circuit, or at least all the non-Clifford gates, are random in, in some precise way. And they show that you know, if you take a random circuit, you take you know, some given circuit instance, you simulate that circuit, you measure something at the end, they can provide a classical algorithm that efficiently simulates that, and it works with some very high probability over the ensemble of random circuits. And so this was a super nice result. It's kind of one of the first results that rigorizes this physics intuition I initially presented. Um, but it does have sort of an important restriction, which is that it only succeeds for random circuits, where every single gate, every non-Clifford gate is random. And you can see, you know, people have been thinking about this for, you know, some amount of time, and this randomness restriction has never been able to be removed. Um, it, it, you know, simplifies the, you know, these random circuits have some simpler form that's much easier to analyze and, and easier to prove these things. And so this leaves an open question, which is, we have these random circuits on one hand. We have this very you know, unnatural construction by the 90s paper on the other. We know this is easy to simulate. This might be hard. What is the landscape in the middle? So if we have some non-random circuit, but maybe we place some restriction on the, the type of that circuit, is it easy or hard to simulate when we include noise? OK. And so in this talk, um, I want to provide some progress on both of these questions regarding benchmarking and computational complexity of noisy circuits. And I'll do so with just some really simple ideas about how information moves under quantum circuits or quantum Hamiltonians. And so in the first part of this talk, um, I'll discuss how we can use sort of this idea of quantum information dynamics to understand the behavior of this Loschmidt echo in ergodic many-body quantum systems. So say some ergodic Hamiltonian, uh, and that Hamiltonian evolution comprises U. And in the second part of the talk, I'll make sort of one additional complex connection between the locality of information and the complexity of classically simulating it uh, to address this second question. What is the computational power of noisy quantum circuits? And I'll provide uh, in the second part a polynomial time classical algorithm for almost any noisy quantum circuit I'll describe this in detail, but roughly, we can now remove all of the randomness from these gates. We can take any series of gates, any observable we might be interested at the end, and we can provide an algorithm that works with high probability over some ensemble of initial states, say the computational basis. Also any noise? Sorry? Also any noise? Uh, it's single qubit decoherence for now, but I think it would very easily generalize to sort of any, it has to be unital noise, but as long as your noise is kind of complete in the poly basis, in a way I can explain in detail later, um, it, it should carry over. Okay, so I'll start with the first and, and introduce these basic ideas and then move to the second. Uh, and, and one thing to say, uh, the first part is going to be uh, kind of physics-y and practical, but not at all rigorous. The second part is going to be rigorous, but not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just to set expectations. Um, okay, so, so what do I mean when I say quantum information dynamics? 
Uh, so this is a series of ideas that have really, they've been around for a long time, but caught a lot of attention in the last decade or so. And the question here is just, how does local information under, in some many-body system evolve in time? And so let's imagine, you know, I store some information in some qubit at time zero, say whether that qubit is up or down. I apply some Hamiltonian evolution or some circuit. Uh, this qubit interacts with other qubits in the system. And the general thing we observe is that this information becomes stored very non-locally at later times. So if I have the state of the system at some late time, and I want to detect if this initial qubit was up or down, I need to measure some very non-local entangled observable across my system. And uh, in practice, how we diagnose this is we represent this initial information with some operator. So this could be like some poly Z operator representing if the qubit was up or down. And we track the evolution of this operator in the Heisenberg basis. And we see that at late times, this operator has very large support across all the qubits of the system. And this is kind of a general expectation for ergodic quantum circuits or Hamiltonians. And there's been tons of uh, work on how to diagnose this and how this behaves in different systems and what these ideas are useful for over the last decade or so. And so for the purposes of this talk, I, I want to introduce a, just a slightly more uh, quantitative way of measuring how operators, how information grows. And this is something called the operator size, also called the poly weight or the degree. Um, so let's start with just a poly string. So a poly string, just a tensor product of poly operators at each site. And I'll define the size of a poly string as just its number of non-identity elements. So this string has, you know, x, y, z, x, x, y, six, uh, size six. So no notion of geometric locality here, just the number of non-identity polys. Okay, so this works for poly strings. How do we define the size for more general operators? So if I have some general time evolved operator, uh, I can always write it as a sum of different poly strings. And in particular, it might be a superposition of both very high size strings and very low size strings with some coefficients that I've written here as CR and these CR will depend on time. And so from these coefficients, I can always define a probability distribution for this operator, which I'll call the operator size distribution, which is just some probability distribution for what is the size of these poly strings composing the time evolved operator. So this distribution, you know, is normalized. It has some you know, mean, it has some width, it has various moments, you know, it just has some entire functional form that depends on these coefficients. And um, one just brief point to, to make about these is that people have studied these objects in lots of different physical systems, and we have good expectations for how they behave in lots of different classes of ergodic many-body dynamics. Uh, the details are not important for this talk, but just to give you a sense that, that people understand how these behave. Uh, the one general feature is important just to connect to earlier. If we start with some local operator, so this is very low size at the left, over time this size typically grows, it moves to the right. And how it does so depends in detail on the dynamics of the system. Okay, and so now let's return to uh, our original question, which is how does noise affect the fidelity of this Loschmidt echo? Um, so let's think about how noise propagates in some uh, many-body quantum circuit. So say I'm doing this Loschmidt echo, and I have some noise events occurring throughout this circuit, some errors distributed in some way in space and time. Uh, and I'm interested how these events affect, you know, some fidelity I'm measuring at the end. In this case, I'm thinking of, you know, preparing some qubit in the zero state, applying u, applying u dagger, and measuring the fidelity to get that single qubit for simplicity in the zero state at the end. Okay, well, there's some basic intuition that these errors should propagate um, according to the dynamics of the circuit. So if my circuit has some interactions or some gates, uh, these can spread the errors to act on multiple qubits, and we can draw, you know, some simple light cone for each error, and an error will affect my final observable for simplicity, you know, uh, as a basic approximation, if this light cone overlaps with this observable. Just some really simple intuition. Turns out to be a little more useful to work in the Heisenberg picture, so imagine I have this observable I'm interested in, I backwards time evolve it through the circuit, and now an error will affect this observable if it's you know, in the light cone 
of, of this operator, just as a, a rough intuition. Um, and so what we see from this is that as this operator spreads and becomes more non-local, it becomes much more sensitive to noise. Because uh, if we have a non-local operator with support on many sites, it's affected by a noise event on any of those sites. So, so it's very fragile to noise once it's become highly non-local. And uh, so in particular, if I think I have some operator, it's a sum of different polystrings. The amplitudes of each of these polystrings will decay roughly proportional to their number of non-identity elements. Because these strings have support on you know, many sites of the system. They're affected by noise events on any site that they have support on. Whereas some small size string, say just a single qubit x, can only be affected by a noise event on that qubit that it has support on. And so we can make this intuition more precise by saying that noise dec decays the amplitudes of polystrings at a rate proportional to their size. And this uh, is exact if you have single qubit decoherence, but we expect, sort of for ergodic many body dynamics, that this is a good approximation for any local noise model. How are you describing operator dynamics with noise? Because Heisenberg is only unitary. Uh, oh, how do you describe it? Uh, so you can think of the operator time evolved under the Limbladian. Um, and still, there's a notion of the Limbladian in the Heisenberg picture. And yeah, you basically just look at that time evolution of the operator under the Heisenberg Limbladian and write it as a sum of polystrings. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another stupid question. Why doesn't the noise appear in the middle? Uh, it, it could in principle. I guess I was imagining we, I mean, it also appears in you. I just didn't draw that. Oh, okay. Um, so, so you could have the noise in the middle. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Because so somehow, you know, you do something right and then something. If you wait a long happens. time in the middle, maybe some more stuff happens. Exactly. And, and if it occurs in the middle and my operator, you know, has some size at this final time, that's how sensitive it is. OK, so uh, this is a pretty simple and intuitive connection. Now let's use this and combine it with all these models we have for how operators spread, what this, how this size behaves, to understand how noise impacts uh, the fidelity of this Lashmid echo. So um, if we, let, let's start with just a picture. Imagine we have some size distribution shown in blue, and we act just a little bit of noise on it. So we know the large size components of this distribution are very strongly damped by noise. So uh, the amplitude of these components will go down by a large amount. As we decrease the size, we're increasingly less susceptible to noise. And in particular, at very low sizes, we have, you know, we're very insensitive to noise. That's because you look at your neutral noise, so it will basically remove operators. Yes, yes. If you, we have some arguments that if you have non-neutral noise, and you have ergodic dynamics, we think that to leading order, it should have a similar effect. Because what you're basically saying is that the noise removes poly operators, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it decays the amplitude of those poly operators. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but, but yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and, and so if we act, take some size distribution, we act some noise channel on it, we'll end up with something like the red distribution shown. It's actually going down and not left, and it should stay normalized. Maybe this is important, sorry. That will be important in one second. But, but you're saying it's important it goes down and not, it doesn't move to the left. Yeah, so... My so, question, right, you replace all these high identities. But then you, yeah, you, you don't move replace the them. left and not down. You don't replace them, you just delete them. What happens to the probability? I mean, it should integrate one, you should know. It turns out the probability is not conserved under noise. Um, this is not a quantum state, this oh, is yeah. an operator, okay. and, and so it's okay. It's... Uh, the noise preserves the trace of the operator because it's unital. Um, OK, so let's notice just two basic ways that this red noisy distribution differs from the blue noiseless distribution. One, the normalization of the distribution is now less than one. The area under the red curve is less than that under the blue. Um, and in particular, we can derive just a, a simple equation for how this normalization decays. It decays at a rate proportional to the microscopic noise rate gamma times the average size of this distribution. If I have a very non-local operator, then it decays very fast due to noise. If I have a relatively local operator, it decays less. 
And if you just assume this phenomenological model where noise is proportional to size, you can easily derive this equation. It turns out that the normalization of this operator is exactly equal to the fidelity of this Loschmidt echo. Um, this is, again, you know, somewhat easy to see if you just take this operator, time evolve it, take the same operator over here, also time evolve it, and, and take their, their inner product. Okay, so, so now we know that the decay of the Loschmidt echo is governed by the behavior of the operator size, how local or non-local my information is. Uh, we can also notice a second effect, uh, or a second way the red distribution differs from the blue, which is that sort of, on average, if we did normalize it, it's shifted towards smaller sizes. Um, and the reason is that, you know, initially we had some support on lots of operators, and the large size operators decayed, and the small size ones were, were relatively unaffected. And so if our distribution has some large variance in size, it's very broad, then the mean of that distribution will get shifted to the left by noise. And so we can derive a, a similar phenomenological equation where the change in the average size, so the center of this distribution, uh, evolves in time according to some piece, depending on the unitary dynamics, some growth from the interactions in my circuit, but then also some decay that's proportional to the variance of this distribution. Um, and this is not important, but it turns out, you know, this average size is also an observable. It's related to things like OTOX, which you may or may not be familiar with. And so now, if we want to understand the behavior of the Loschmann echo, we need to understand the behavior of the size. But if we need to understand the behavior of the size, we need to understand this interplay between growth in operators under unitary dynamics and decay from the noise. And the, that interplay, which will depend on the specific dynamics of the system, uh, of the system we're interested in, will determine the functional form of the Loschmidt echo. And so uh, what we can do is we can leverage all of these models that people have come up with for how size distributions behave in different types of circuits. Yeah? Can you just Explain like what exactly you mean by local echoes. You're somehow talking about local observables, but I think of Loschmidt echoes as just something. Yeah, like yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so I'm using Loschmidt echo as a general term where we take some state, evolve it forward, evolve it backwards, and measure some fidelity. And you can imagine taking some many-body quantum state here, like a many-body pure state, evolving forward and backwards, and measuring some many-body fidelity. You can imagine taking a pure state, evolving forward and backwards, and just measuring a local fidelity as well. Um, and it, so, so this would be like, say, start with the all zero state, go forward backwards, and measure the probability for bit one to be zero at the end. That's why this argument applies. That is why this operator starts out being local. Um, it turns out in, like, especially in these NMR experiments that, that first studied this, this is the relevant scenario, um, because they're basically measuring a polarization at the end. And the polarization is some sum of single qubit operators, like Z operators on every qubit. Um, yes, if you had some, yeah, yeah. So the shift to shape is the uh, uh, Yes, I, I can, maybe it, uh, so, so the OTOC basically measures whether this operator has support on some given qubit. The size me measures the total support of the operator. So it turns out if you take the average of the OTOC over all qubits, it's exactly equal to the size. And then the, the higher moments of this size distribution are sort of aspects beyond what is captured by OTOCs. Okay, so um, we can take this knowledge of how operator size behaves in different, mostly ergodic, many-body dynamics, uh, and we can solve in many different cases for what this implies for the Loschmidt echo. And we can come up with predictions for the Loschmidt echo in, in various cases. And it will depend on the dimensionality of the system, conservation laws, integrability. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry to ask one more question yeah. on the previous slide. Um, your equation here with the, the variance and the size. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of like setting up like a, a Clifford circuit where yeah. it, you know, you start from like a single weight one operator, mm -hmm. and 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 you can have that variance be zero and, yeah, and have yeah. it full way to yeah, the yeah. end. Does that mean that that wouldn't decay? It means that the normalization would. So so the scenario you're describing a Clifford circuit 
I'd always be a poly operator, so my size is basically a delta function. That's just yeah. the size of that operator. From the first part here, the normalization of that decays, the amplitude of that delta function goes down, but uh, yeah, the size itself is unchanged. It's just kind of, we're losing information to the environment, but the information that remains in our system is kind of the exact same as under unitary dynamics. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so um, yes, that, that's one example of how, you know, this interplay depends a lot on the dynamics of the circuit you put in. Okay, and, and so for now I just wanna focus on one, probably the most interesting and relevant example, which turns out to be when we have uh, a many body system with all to all interactions. So some you know, few body, say two body interactions, but very non-local across our system. And I just wanna kind of briefly describe the result to you and, and show some comparison to these NMR experiments I mentioned. So uh, again, the idea is we have lots of, of uh, qubits or degrees of freedom, and they're coupled very non-locally. I guess I didn't draw this very well here, but we imagine that there's some interaction between all of these qubits in some you know, non-local manner. Uh, a basic fact that, that's known here is that the size will grow exponentially in time, because if I have some local information at time zero, it might spread to one site after one layer of my circuit, then it might spread to you know, two more sites after another layer, and each of these sites will spread to more. So I basically kind of double uh, with every time step. Uh, and this is kind of a universal property of all to all dynamics. Um, another universal property that's perhaps less known is that this distribution is very broad. So if I drew this size distribution, its width is kind of the same order as its mean. Um, and just from these, very, these two very basic facts, we can derive a prediction for how the Loschmidt echo behaves in these systems. Uh, so again, there's some growth term this is exponential growth because we have all to all dynamics with some Lyapunov exponent lambda. And then we have some decay due to noise proportional to the variance of the distribution. If we just plug in that this variance is of order the size squared because this distribution is very broad, uh, we get some phenomenological equation for how the size behaves. And just by solving this, we see that at early times this first lambda s term dominates and we have exponential growth of our operator. Then at late times, you know, as the size grows, the second term becomes more and more important. Noise has a larger and larger effect on my operator. And eventually I saturate just to some finite plateau set by the ratio of the Lyapunov exponent and the noise rate. So if I have a very small noise rate, I grow to a large size, very non-local information. If I have strong noise, that I'll saturate to a very small size, very local information. And Okay, and from this we can come up with predictions for the Loschmidt echo. Basically, initially it decays, you know, according to however the size grows, but asymptotically this size approaches a constant, and so this Loschmidt echo just approaches some constant decay rate, that's the microscopic noise rate, times the size. And a an kind of curious prediction of this is that this decay rate is actually independent of the noise rate in my system because I have some microscopic noise gamma, but then I also have the size, which is set to be uh, of order one over gamma. And so if my decay rate is gamma times the size, these factors of gamma cancel, and I get that the asymptotic decay of the Loschmidt echo is actually independent of the noise rate in my system. Uh, which is, so this is a kind of funny result, um, and it actually echoes some of these results I mentioned earlier in single particle quantum chaos. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what model you're using here? I mean, you're going to like a thousand. Yeah, the, these numerics are for random unitary circuits, um, simply to push the system size to, to very large numbers of qubits. So take a bunch of qubits, uh, at every time step pair them up in some random set of pairs, do a Haar random or Clifford random gate on those pairs, and then at the next time step repair them up in a random way, do some random gates, and, uh, and just proceed like this in time. Yeah. The formula there in the corner, that's yeah. even or heuristic or this, wrong or? This is for single qubit decoherence. This is uh, proven, I mean it's very, it's very simple to derive, um, where this s is the average size as a function of time. But then this average size of course depends on the dynamics and the noise of your circuit. Yeah, um, but in yeah. general verifying the Apple 
for large matrices is not really a yeah, yeah. So, easy game, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. So this connection is easy between Lo Schmidt echo and size. Okay. Understanding the size is hard. It, yeah, right. yeah. And so, yeah, we come up with some toy model so that we can study this in large systems, and we see this behavior in that toy model. We have a phenomenological explanation for it, but we don't, you know, know for sure that this works for some Hamiltonian we're interested in. Yeah. So where did this uh, l l lambda or Lyapunov exponent come from? Yeah. So this is it's basically set by the. Uh, so if I if I have a circuit, it would just be like, say two or something. I double at each time step. If I have a Hamiltonian, it will be proportional to the interaction strength of that Hamiltonian. Um, so this ratio is like between my native interaction strength and my noise. OK, so, so as I said, this is just some toy model. It's a very simple toy model we can simulate. Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you fixing the initial operator, or are you varying? Uh, I'm fixing it. And averaging somehow over the friends. Setups also takes care of looking at so what we have in mind is just a fixed operator and a fixed circuit or Hamiltonian. Um, this, yeah, so we have in mind a fixed operator and a fixed circuit. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're just coming up with a phenomenological model to capture that. It turns out that the way operators spread is, has some kind of like, it looks like a stochastic process at least for large sizes in ergodic systems. And, but, but we always are thinking about a fixed operator and a fixed circuit to start with. But it's chosen to have a low weight? Or? Yeah, so this would be like a, a single qubit Z operator, whatever local fidelity we're measuring in the circuit. And do things change both days if I were to take a more at the front? Uh, if I change that operator or take a, yeah, so if you change that operator, um, it will depend a little bit on how that operator overlaps with any conserved quantities in your circuit. That, that will change the behavior a significant amount. Um, but besides that, like sort of some order one amount of data regarding the conserved quantities, uh, we think that lots of this behavior at large sizes is universal. Um, kind of in a similar vein to Daniel's talk this morning. Some of this like very non-local physics of how information moves in circuits turns out to be very universal across different uh, Can I ask you systems. one more question? Yeah. Uh, so is qualitatively the coherence, um, like T2 type processes and just the polarizing noise similar in this case? Yeah, in this case, and if the dynamics are ergodic, we think they'll be pretty similar. And we have some arguments, um, just approximations and arguments to show that. Um, it will. It will be similar in the Loschmidt echo. It, they might, of course, have different effects on some like different computation you wanted to do. The point is that this Loschmidt echo is kind of dominated by these relatively large size components, and these are relatively insensitive to the microscopics. Um, yeah. So, so for for ergodic circuits and Loschmidt echoes, it's relatively independent of the noise model. Okay. And so uh, I just, the last thing to discuss on this topic is that I think these kind of simple phenomenological equations actually have a lot of power to explain uh, the, the Loschmidt echoes that have been observed in experiments. So I've shown just one example here. This is an experiment that came up out while we were preparing the paper, actually. And it turns out they measure almost exactly what we would like them to. Uh, so they measure the Loschmidt echo, this normalization of the operator. They do it for a couple different error strengths. Let's just focus on the yellow curve here. They see there's some non-universal behavior at early times, and then you approach some simple exponential decay with some constant rate in time. The rate they found was 13.5. They also measured something that's kind of approximately given by the size, so the other quantity that I've described. And they see the size grows exponentially at early times, this is a log plot, and then saturates to some finite value. And so this behavior is exactly the same as we get in this very simple toy model of an all-to-all -all random circuit. And you know, they check this for different microscopic noise rates. They see that the uh, asymptotic decay rate is independent of the noise, 
basically almost all aspects of, of this are replicated by these very simple toy models and phenomenological equations. You might ask why, why this experiment looks like it's effectively all to all. It turns out these uh, nuclear spins are arranged on some 3D lattice, but they have 192 nearest neighbors. So at the time scales of the experiment, they are basically, you know, we have good reason to think they're effectively all to all interacting. And one thing to note is just like these experiments are really amazingly coherent. Like uh, in some of these, they, they reach decent fidelities at up to a thousand spins. Um, so this is really kind of a large scale many body quantum phenomena. Okay. And so in the remaining 10 minutes, uh, I want to just briefly describe this, this second result regarding the computational complexity of noisy circuits. And uh, all right, so I'll first just state our results, and then I'll give you kind of the simple intuition for, for how it works. So um, again, we're switching more from physics to something very rigorous here, trying, trying to prove uh, that this classical algorithm simulates noisy circuits. So suppose we have some circuit, again, some initial state, some gate, some observable at the end, and say we're just interested in computing the expectation value of some observable. Uh, and I'm going to make one restriction uh, that, that uh, allows us to, to provide a classical algorithm for this. So if you remember, in these previous al algorithms for random circuits, we had to assume that every non-Clifford gate in the circuit was drawn at random from some two qubit gate distribution. I will make a much, much simpler assumption on the circuit. Pick any set of gates you want. I've shown them in 1D. They can be, you know, with any geometry, two local gates at each time step. Any observable you want at the end. But I will only require success with high probability over some ensemble of initial states. So say I feed in a random bit string to this circuit, so a random state in the computational basis, I perform my circuit, I measure my observable. I'll provide a classical algorithm that also takes in that bit string, computes, gives you some observable. And for that bit string, you can compare the, bit, the expectation value of my classical algorithm to the quantum, the noisy quantum experiment. And they will agree with a very high probability, or in other words, with a very low average error over this ensemble of initial bit strings. And uh, okay, I, I already said this, but but this is the, the precise statement. So to compute this expectation value to with, within some root mean square error epsilon, so the, the average is over, again, this ensemble, um, our algorithm requires time n to the one over gamma log, the depth of the circuit over the desired precision epsilon. And so the, the punchline here is that if this noise rate is constant and this desired precision is constant, then even as we increase the number of qubits in our experiment, um, the complexity to classically simulate that experiment only increases polynomially in n. Um, the, of course, ma major restriction here is this factor of one over gamma. So this bound is exponential in the inverse noise rate. This is to some extent unavoidable. It, and it's shared with all previous you know, similar uh, results. And this is just telling you that kind of if you have a noisy system, the effective number of qubits you have in terms of complexity is, is uh, below you know, one over the noise rate. So there's, if you have some noise rate, the complexity of your uh, experiment is fundamentally limited by that noise rate. OK, uh, the idea is very simple. Um, following you know, the, the earlier part of this talk, we take this operator that we want to measure, we evolve it in the Heisenberg picture through this circuit, and we only keep the low size components of this operator. So we already saw that the, this operator has support on you lots of different sizes, small sizes and large sizes. And in the previous part of this talk, we saw the large size components are strongly damped by noise. This means they contribute very little in the end to whatever expectation value I'm calculating. And so if I want to simulate the system, I can just throw away all of those large size components of the operator and only keep track of the low size polys. And it turns out that, uh, as I'll describe, you, you can rigorize this and prove that this, this algorithm works. Um, 
OK, so, so this is just the basic idea I just described in a bit more detail. Um, the idea is to uh, perform this decomposition of the operator in the poly basis at each time step of the circuit. So, you know, I start with some initial operator O, I perform some layer of gates. Here, the, the colors are meant to represent like X, Y, and Z. White would be, I have the identity support on that site. I start with some operator O, I perform some gates. It might delocalize to, to have support on more qubits. And again, at, at, at this time step, it's a sum of, you know, a couple different poly strings. I just decompose those strings in the poly basis, say for some fixed poly operator here. And now I do my circuit again. Again, this, these strings might spread. I might be a sum of you know, a, different, a couple different poly strings at this time. I again decompose in the poly basis. And I just keep doing that at, at every time step of my circuit. And so from this, I can write kind of a Feynman path integral, but for operators in the, the poly basis. And this picture uh, is, is not my own. This is the same picture used in this previous result for simulating random quantum circuits. Noisy random quantum circuits. OK, and so we can do this. We can write our uh, expectation value as a sum of contributions from a bunch of different poly paths. And we can perform a sort of a binary decomposition of these paths. Let's group all of the low weight paths on the left and all of the high weight paths on the right. Where by weight, I mean uh, that at each time step, so at each slice of this circuit, the, sorry, Weight, I, I'm switching from size to weight. They're the same, exact same object. Uh, the size or the weight is less than some threshold L. So in here, uh, I set L equals four. So at every time step on this left, our operator has support on uh, four or fewer sites. And now the basic observation is we know these high weight paths are very strongly affected by noise because they have support on lots of locations in space time. And every one of these locations might be sensitive to noise. So we know the amplitude of a given high weight path will be very small once we add noise to our system. At the same time, we know that there are exponentially many high weight configurations, but only polynomially many low weight configurations. Because if I only have support on you know, L qubits, there's uh, n choose L, different ways to choose these qubits. And at each one of those qubits, I can choose x, y, or z. So the number of low weight configurations at each time step is less than 3n to the L. And so the basic idea is these contributions are small due to noise. These contributions are easy to keep track of because there's only polynomially many. So I just simulate my system by keeping track of these contributions on the left. Now, the trickery comes in bounding the error of this uh, algorithm. Um, in a similar but slightly different algorithm, uh, for random quantum circuits, they really use properties that are inherent to random circuits to bound this error. Basically, they use that you have all these poly paths. They all have individual amplitude. And moreover, in random circuits, they're very unlikely to coherently interfere. Um, and from that, you, you have kind of an effective Markov process describing how these poly strings behave in a random circuit. And you can use conservation of probability in that Markov process to bound the error. Here, uh, you know, we, we provide just a very slightly different algorithm um, and different proof techniques to bound the error for any quantum circuit. Um, again, the algorithm is as I described. We only keep track of paths whose poly weight is less than some threshold at each time step. I've drawn this in a slightly different fashion here, where I've imagined writing each path, you know, labeling it by its weight, which might depend on time uh, as a function of time. Now, I keep track of all of these paths, but as soon as one of them goes above this threshold L, I just throw it away. I set it to zero. And so at each time step, I truncate all of the paths that go above this threshold. These paths have a low contribution because they are high size and very affected by error. That's tried, I tried to show that with the, the uh, fading lines here. Um, and at the end, you know, I just have the poly paths I kept track of that never went above this threshold, and I can track them with whatever my input state was. And it turns out it's pretty simple to bound the error in this. It's mostly just Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, but if you, you truncate basically t times at each time, your error is uh, e to the minus gamma L. Gamma is the noise rate. L is the threshold size. And so your overall error is less than uh, 
square root t times e to the minus gamma l. At the same time, this requires classical resources proportional to n to the l, which is just the number of poly configurations at each time step that I need to keep track of. And uh, yeah, this, this you can see very simply uh, this n to the l, if I plug in l, if I choose my l according to this desired error epsilon, I get this scaling I initially showed. Uh, and um, okay, the, the proof technique is, Pretty, pretty simple, but we just perform some, we group these polypaths in some sort of tree, and this allows us to easily found the error. Yeah? Would you expect the number of truncations to be exponential in time? Yes. So this is actually why the previous methods for random circuits don't work here, is because you are, you're truncating like exponentially many paths at each time. And you know each one individually is small, but you need to bound like the, the contribution of all of them together. And here we kind of manage that by just grouping all of these paths into some operator. And we write my operator at this time step as a sum of all the paths that are small plus all the paths that are large. And now, because these operators sum to some operator with bounded norm, we know that you know, the norm of each of these is bounded. And then we know additionally that the norm of this decays due to, to error. And so it's just a slightly smarter way of grouping the polypaths. Um, in this kind of bunched poly tree that allows you to um, bound the error. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, there's various simple extensions. I won't go into this, but just reductions of this result. You can consider a fixed but highly mixed state. This is pretty intuitive. You just average over some ensemble of initial states. You can also push the randomness from this initial state into the circuit itself. So, so if I imagine this bit string was achieved by you know, applying X operations onto an initial state, I can push those random X operations into the circuit. And so this algorithm succeeds for a fixed initial state with some spatially disordered quantum circuit. Uh, so this is kind of the same operation conjugates each gate uh, at each qubit. It's the same operation through, each, through time. And the last thing I just wanted to touch on was a uh, implications of this for NISC experiments. And so the very obvious thing uh, you might have noticed is this bound was exponential in the inverse noise rate. And for modern devices, uh, noise rates are quite good. Our bounds are quite weak. Um, again, this, to some extent, this is the limit of what you can rigorously prove. To some extent, this is the fact that modern devices are quite good. But uh, as we... We, we've seen a little bit in this workshop, designing NISC circuits that take advantage of these good noise bu budgets is challenging. And there's been a lot of work on this in, in the physics community, and it also somewhat illustrated by uh, Abhinev's talk on Monday, where we saw that even though IBM had a very high fidelity quantum circuit, um, that doesn't mean that anything you do with that system will be hard to classically simulate. Um, and the, the intuition behind you know, most of these approaches is that even though your system in principle could keep track of very non-local information, because your fidelity is very good, in practice, your circuits are often only dependent on relatively local information. And that opens the door to kind of approximate classical simulation algorithms that only keep track of local information. And so along these lines, this result provides just a simple test for if a circuit is classically simulable. And it, it's just the statement that complex quantum circuits must be highly sensitive to noise. Uh, the intuition is just if I have some quantum circuit, I perform it, say my device is perfect. Now, if that circuit is not very sensitive to noise, I could get the same result on a noisy device. And I could classically simulate that noisy device via the result that I showed. And so in particular, you know, you can make this a, you can kind of invert this statement. If you want some qu quantum experiment to have a classical complexity chi, it must only succeed for noise rates less than something that depends on chi. In particular, if you want the complexity to grow with n, you must require noise rates less than 1 over n. So uh, I'll wrap up now because I've run a tiny bit over time. Various future directions, and I'd like to thank my, my advisor, Norman Yao. <laughs>